Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat from Oregon and chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Sir, thanks for making time to be with us. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate what you guys do to bring the public into the discussion of key issues. As we were talking beforehand, I was a lowly staffer in your office. And, I remember. Uh, and was back, uh, back, back there with you in uh, 1999, back in the early days of your Senate career. Of course, you had been in the House for a long time prior to that. Uh, why don't you just start us off? I hope your resume you takes credit for your good work on the Y2K bill that I authored with John McCain. Well, that's right. Uh, and I remember that bill. And I will just say that uh, if we screw stuff up here at State Reform, of course, the blame <laughs> is mine, but the credit is yours for uh, saving my interest in healthcare. So thanks for doing right. this. Um, tell us how the Senate is different. Let's just start off there with kind of a higher level question. How is the Senate different today in 2021 than it was back in those early days of your Senate career? Back well, the, the, the Senate, of course, reflects the polarization in our society. In other words, the extremes get more extreme. And that really ripples through everything that goes on in the Senate because the Senate is a process where ultimately you got to get all 100 senators to support something. And finding common ground gets to be more challenging. Now, on the Finance Committee, I feel very fortunate that the ranking member is Mike Crapo of Idaho. And he and I have worked together so often on infrastructure um, issues, on forestry uh, issues. We wrote the landmark proposal to beef up the way uh, the Forest Service fights fire by making sure that prevention money is protected, deal with uh, big fires from the disaster accounts. So I'm very fortunate uh, there, but this is certainly going to be a challenging year. I remember back in those early days, of course, you took over for Senator Bob Packwood, who was for a time chair also of the Senate Finance Committee. Now that you're chair of the committee and hold the gavel, give us a sense of the scope of your work that you have planned for the committee. Could be, of course, related to healthcare, and we'll spend plenty of time on that, but other topics before the committee for 2021 as well. When people ask me about the scope of the committee, I say, how long do you have for an answer? Because we're very involved now in taxes. We're very involved in infrastructure. We're very involved in housing. We're very involved in trade. The list goes um, on and on. And then, of course, um, ever since my days with, uh, with the Gray Panthers and I ran the legal aid program for the uh, elderly, I've always thought that health care was the most important issue because if you and your loved ones don't have your health, then everything else pretty much goes by the boards. So I recall back in 2009 when what becomes the Affordable Care Act is, uh, is ultimately passed in 2010, that it was really Max Baucus's Senate Finance Committee that led the way on, on generating the conversation around that bill. Do you see the Senate Finance Committee playing a similar role in terms of shaping conversation in Congress around healthcare over the next year? I believe we'll have a considerable opportunity. And the fact is the country spent $3.8 trillion on healthcare last year. If you divide $3.8 trillion uh, by 330 million you know, Americans, we could send a check for more than $40,000 to everybody in America for their health. So um, we'll have a debate about where that 3.8 trillion goes, but um, the Finance Committee has jurisdiction over Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance uh, Program, uh, the exchanges uh, where uh, you have uh, a variety of, uh, of ways uh, to deliver uh, health care. So we have jurisdiction out of the 3.8 trillion of more than $2 trillion. So we'll be very involved in those, those issues. And certainly as long as I'm the uh, uh, chair, it'll be a big focus of our work. Yeah. Senator Patty Murray from Washington State is, of course, the chair now of the Senate Health Education Labor Pensions Committee to the, the other primary health care committee. How do you think Northwest, the Northwest culture, the Northwest experience with health reform um, can inform the national conversation about reform? Well, Senator Murray and I work very closely uh, uh, together and we have different you know, jurisdiction. For example, she would have the Centers for Disease Control and the FDA and we have these uh, tax programs, Medicare and, and Medicaid. But I'll tell you, the Northwest particularly has long been a leader in terms of driving state innovation. You know, both of us have, and our governors, have been um, very interested in sort of out of the box kind of creative approaches. For example, we were for paying for value 
long before it became cool, long before it became part of a national kind of uh, kind of debate. And uh, in fact, I wrote a separate provision of the Affordable Care Act it was in my Bipartisan Healthy Americans Act called Section 1332 to give states a broad berth in terms of showing that they could meet the criteria, the coverage criteria in the Affordable Care Act, but would get more flexibility in terms of how they went about achieving it. I really thought that 1332 section was uh, a huge opportunity for states and particularly maybe red states that wanted greater flexibility. It has been used a little bit, but sparingly related to reinsurance programs in some states. Do you, why do you think more states didn't take advantage of that section that you inserted into the ACA? Well, I, I was struck particularly why red states weren't using it because they would always say, you know, if the government would just give us the flexibility and the freedom, you know, we're gonna go in there, we can show, we can prove that we can meet all these coverage targets if you just give us um, the flexibility. So you'll have to ask some of those red state, uh, you know, governors um, why they were reluctant. I think some of them really didn't wanna go very far down the road with respect to Medicaid, which I think is, is unfortunate. Yeah, there's, uh... You know, there's an active conversation during the presidential primaries about perhaps expanding Medicare eligibility down the age uh, ladder. Senator uh, Sanders, I understand, will uh, push to expand Medicare in his budget committee uh, down to age 65 or eligibility down to age 65 or 55. What are your thoughts on whether that makes sense moving forward? Well, I've, I've long been supportive of that. And let me kind of walk people who are following this through what I think is the transition. If you look at 2009, Barack Obama said, you're gonna be able to keep what you have. And that was private sector coverage. In my bipartisan proposal, the Healthy Americans Act, we had seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and we were able to prove the Congressional Budget Office scored it, that for the amount of money spend, uh, being spent, people in America, who, are not, who weren't on Medicare or in the military could have coverage like their member of Congress for the amount of money we were spending. Now that was private coverage because it was FEHBP, what members of Congress had. Now I think, and it's apropos of your question, there is going to be an interest in more Medicare type choices. That's how I, I would characterize the difference between now and 2009. 2009, you have the president keep what you have. My federal uh, employee benefit kind of structure that would get people who weren't on Medicare in the military to universal coverage. Now there is an interest in more Medicare type choices. I am very supportive of that kind of effort. And if you look down the dais on the finance committee, we've got pretty much everything. We've got people who are proposing lowering the age. We've got folks who want to have people buy into Medicare. We want people who want to have more opportunities to hit coverage gaps through Medicaid. You can almost go down um, the row and um, see uh, people with uh, various kinds of options for Medicare type choices. That's pretty much the big difference between what I see in 2009, and what I see today. And so do you think that that momentum around Medicare type choices uh, is likely to coalesce around something? Or do you think that those divisions perhaps just in the Democratic conference between more practical and moderate folks versus more progressive uh, folks, do you think that those divisions are pretty deep? Well, I, again, I wouldn't slot these as some kind of liberal, moderate kind of approach. For example, the idea of more competition particularly to contain healthcare uh, costs is very popular across the um, political spectrum. So if you talk about a public option, the whole point of a public option is to have more competition, more accountability, a chance to hold costs down. So I, I think this goes beyond some kind of, well, here's where liberals are, here's where moderates are. I think these kinds of, of choices that contain costs that get more accountability, that create more competition in the healthcare system are popular across the political spectrum, popular with a lot of Republicans. Yeah. 
I wonder if uh, this might be an oversimplification, and if it is, I'm, I'm sorry, but I feel like there's this sort of categorization of some who think that, like Nancy Pelosi, for instance, who's a strong advocate of building on the ACA, and then others uh, like uh, Senator Sanders, who I mentioned, who in some ways want to do away with the ACA and do, do something more aggressive. How do you sort of come down on that balance between expanding on the ACA, building on it, and then maybe sh versus shifting gears and doing something different? Well, again, I think there's a lot of commonality. For example, I think there is a recognition in what I've been talking about for years, that you've got to modernize the employer-based system. And as you know, we got this sort of by accident in the 1940s or wage and price controls. Nobody knew how to deliver health care. So I said, well, put it on the employer. The employer said, well, I'll do it, but I'm going to factor it into the... Um, prices for goods and, and, and services. Now I see across the political spectrum, moderates and liberals, a recognition that we ought to have more choices for workers. I mean, 160 million people get their care through the employer-based system. I say, if that's what somebody wants, more power to them. I think we also ought to work to have more choices. And I would point out, I think there are a lot of employers particularly in tough global markets where we're competing against China, they'd love to be able to say, I want to focus on my product and not basically be in the healthcare business. The uh, American Rescue Plan Act was a big, pretty, it seems like a pretty massive uh, first step right out of the gate for uh, this Congress and the Biden administration. Do you see that as a, a bill, particularly as it relates to healthcare, that is as significant as the ACA? Is it one step among many? How do you sort of put that in context? Well, it, it, as you know, the um, for, uh, Affordable Care Act focused just on what was kind of traditional, you know, health care. The Recovery Act, of course, has a lot on public health as it relates to vaccinations and, uh, and the like. But I think we tried to address um, big concerns in uh, the Recovery Act, particularly trying to help people with their premiums, you know, trying to give people assistance with their premiums. If you're um, a family of four today, and particularly in a high cost market, you're having real problems, you know, pay, paying the bills if one of your uh, kids, uh, kids get sick. So I think there were significant um, steps and we also provided assistance for individuals, as you know, um, where they have lost their job through no fault of their own and we're trying to help them through the transition. Tax bills will be tough. And of course, those can go through, uh, often can go through a reconciliation process. And this uh, American Rescue Plan Act went through a reconciliation process. For those, your colleague, uh, your seatmate in Oregon, Senator Jeff Merkley argues that the filibuster only applies to democratic priorities. That uh, Republicans like judges and they like tax cuts and you can do that without a filibuster. Uh, but Democrats wanna change policy, improve people's lives, he argues, and that that uh, needs a 60 vote threshold. So what are your thoughts on whether- oh, the first, 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 before we get all into Senate arcane lingo, I'm for the talking filibuster. If somebody feels strongly about an issue, they ought to have to show up and make their case rather than make an objection and then go off to you know, Cancun or somewhere. I mean, we really ought to have some accountability. And this has special implications for us in the Northwest as well. So when I came, when I came to the Senate, the House had um, not um, a long time afterwards had passed a bill to throw Oregon's death with dignity law in the trash can, something that the Northwest cared a lot about. I said, look, we voted for this twice. You're not going to be able to just kind of roll us and you know that's the end of it and just the prospect of my going out to the floor and using an extended amount of time to talk about um, all of the options of hospice and you know end of life care brought both sides together and when the dust settled oregon's death with dignity law had survived and a pretty new united states senator had basically said there's accountability, there was transparency, there was a chance for both sides to work together. I'm convinced if I hadn't used the opportunity at that time, Oregon's death with dignity law would be in the trash can today and it would have affected 
the debate about end of life choices for years to come. So for folks who are watching from Hawaii or New York or Florida or all across the country, um, what do you think, folks that maybe are just getting to know you for the first time, what do you think they should be keeping their eye on when they are watching from afar, if they're not like inside the Beltway folks, but when they're watching from afar and they're wondering how things are happening, what should they keep their eye on in terms of Senate Finance Committee activity, well, hearings I, or issues? I, I think those people who are following this, one of the first things they're gonna care about is who's doing something to prevent them from getting mugged at the pharmacy counter. Because that's what people think about when they think about healthcare. And Donald Trump made all these big promises and then really you know, didn't follow through. Now there are two major ideas on offer. Senator Grassley and I wrote a bill which is hugely important for the people, for example, who take insulin. Insulin prices are up 12 fold in not too long a period of time. The drug is not 12 times better or different. It's the same insulin. It's price gouging. So what Senator Grassley and I did is we got a bill out of the Finance Committee with some significant Republican support. And it basically said, if you charge more than inflation, we're gonna take away some of your tax breaks. And that was a bi bipartisan bill. Uh, Speaker Pelosi in the House uh, is taking a different route, but I'm for the concept that she's talking about as well, which is we ought to get rid of the Medicare restriction that bars the government from negotiating to get millions of seniors a better deal. So two bills, one comes from uh, Senator Grassley and I got out of the Senate Finance Committee, saves the taxpayer about $100 billion, saves consumers billions and, and ripples all the way through the system in a, um, I think, very constructive way. The uh, Congressional Budget Office said it was not price controls because what you're doing is taking away subsidies for um, price gouging. And then uh, I do think that what the speaker is interested in, in terms of lifting the restriction so that Medicare could negotiate I think is a very valuable idea. I'm for it. I've actually offered it before on the Senate floor. So I think those two ideas, if I lived in Hawaii or New York or somewhere else other than the Pacific North, uh, Northwest, uh, I'd be asking what's going to be done about prescription drug prices. I hear a lot of rhetoric from all these politicians, but everybody who's following this discussion knows of people who spent thousands and thousands of, of dollars and it's really hurt them financially. I just told you what I'm working on. I know we're short on time, Senator. I appreciate you being with us. Let me just ask this last question, yeah. which is as you look out on 2021, what gives you hope either personally or politically or about your work in the Senate? Well, I think if you look at the, you know, the recovery you know, plan, a lot of Congresses couldn't do that in two years. We got, we got it done in 100, 100 days. And I think you know, the president made it very clear that he wanted to set a very different tone than Donald Trump. He said, we're going to try to find um, some ways to lower the decibel level and be serious uh, about bringing people together. And his, his approach, as you asked about all the issues we're dealing with, talk about trade. I mean, Donald Trump wanted to do, it a, go, do a go it alone kind of strategy. You know, we're going to kind of muscle everybody around. Joe Biden has said we'll be stronger when we're taking on China by working together. And boy, is that needed because our markets, and we care about this, of course, in the Northwest, our markets in China are more closed today than when Donald Trump took over and made all those boasts. So this is a very consequential time. And the Recovery Act was a bigger lift in 100 days than people could imagine. And a lot of Congresses haven't done in two years what was done. Well, Senator, there are uh, uh, two reasons that we have spent so much time or that I've gotten myself involved in healthcare and worked on this for multiple decades. One is my fabulous wife and uh, the other is working in your office. Uh, oh. So you, Senator Ron you, Wyden, Democrat from Oregon, Senate uh, Finance Committee Chairman, thank you, sir, for being with us. You, I appreciate you, it. You, made, you made my day. Thanks. Thanks, Senator.